the present conflict between Egypt and Sudan, perhaps on one side, uh, and the rest of the Basin countries, uh, is, I would say, a conflict that uh, is partly rooted in history. Not the least the 1989 agreement, but also, of course, the 1959 agreement between Sudan and Egypt. An agreement that, uh, an agreement that says that it is an agreement for the full utilization of the River Nile, although on the two countries uh, is supposed to share the borders of the Nile. By there are of course ten countries in the in the basin. It's, so it's partly uh, rooted in history, but not only in the history of the Nile agreements. It's also rooted in the history of the region itself. Itself, of course, Ethiopia, e Egypt has a long, long history of water control, going back thousands of years, long before the time of the book. While some of the other countries, especially the upstream countries, have a very short history of Nile control. And that is not only a reflection of the Nile Waters Agreement, but it's a reflection of different level of development, or different histories. So it's partly relate, uh, rooted in history, but it's also partly, of course, a result of other kinds of development that has to do with technology, uh, technological capabilities, it has to do with uh, the new insecurity about the water landscape of the future, it has to do with um, a lot of more contemporary geopolitical issues. Problem with water in general, and agreements with water in general, and the problems with water structures or control structures of water in general is that they have a tendency to have a very long-term historical impact. Because it's very difficult to change them. If you build a dam, you have a dam. It's, diffi it's difficult to destroy it again. And in the meantime, of course, any dam, any canal, any water project will have established economic activities along its banks, trade routes, you know, all kinds of things. So by changing the way water is running, by changing the way water is running, you also are bound to change the societies using that kind of water. So, as I said, so uh, this uh, problem of today is partly rooted in history, but it's also a result of contemporary technologically, uh, it's also a result of contemporary technological, political, and economic uh, processes. Uh, now it's uh, it's also uh, you know I mean the whole issue of water and conflict of water and cooperation is also important here. In the 1990s, it was fashionable to say that you could definitely, in the future, have water wars, water wars. That there was a close relationship between a scarcity of water, conflict of interest of a water, and war. A kind of a deterministic relationship. Nowadays, that kind of idea is not very fashionable. After the turn of the century, what became popular was the very opposite idea, that water was a pathway to peace, that water could create cooperation where you did not have cooperation in other areas. And of course, when it comes to the Nile, this would be a very nice idea. The Nile Basin is extremely long. I mean, it covers one-tenth of the African continent. It's almost 7,000 kilometers long. Ten countries, three climatic zones. How many people? Perhaps 10,000? Different ethnic groups. So, if the theory that water is a gateway to peace is right, 
then of course uh, the nine base in its future is the future of cooperation by necessity. I mean, you have a new kind of determinism. Water will create cooperation. But in reality, I think that these ideas, both of them, are too simplistic. It's not either or. It's not, not should not approach this question in this deterministic way. Because what will happen in each and every river basin has to be analyzed concretely and in depth. Because the conflict mechanisms and the cooperation mechanisms of the Nile Basin will definitely be different than the conflict mechanisms and the conflict mechanisms of the Brahmaputra Basin or the Danube Basin or whatever other big international river basin we are talking about. During that period, when the British was the ruler of the entire Nile Basin, a lot of things happened with long-term implications. One thing they did was to try to modernize, of course in accordance with their own interests, the irrigation sector, sector and agriculture in Egypt. By initiating a program of perennial irrigation, also by controlling the now upstream of Egypt. They also turned the Sudan into a kind of hydraulic state, according to my opinion, by establishing the biggest cotton farm in the world in the Gezira scheme in the 1920s. So the northern parts of the Nile Basin experienced during the British, period of the British a kind of revolution in the relationship between man and water. Of course, in accordance with British economic and political interests, but also, but in spite of that fact, you might say, they also developed these kind of areas. So it, uh, when it comes to the Nile, the British in the Nile Basin, we are talking about the kind of imperialism that both built and did not build. In other areas of the Nile Basin, they did not do that much. Uh, for the same reasons. I mean, they put much more emphasis on the development of Northern Sudan and Egypt than they did on Southern Sudan or Uganda, or present-day Uganda, present-day Kenya. Those areas should not use Nile waters. And, I mean, it was not... So, so they did not play that same crucial role in the whole British strategy of things, you might say. So, you might, you, you, it might be possible to argue that the way the British developed my control, increased the regional inequalities in the Nile Basin. At the same time, it's also very important to acknowledge that the British were the first to really approach the whole Nile Basin as one planning unit as one hydrological unit. 